Yesterday, you told reporters off the Senate floor, Senator. Congressman from both sides of the aisle. Both Republicans and Democrats. This was a bipartisan effort. This is not a party issue. Hello, welcome to Across the Aisle. I'm Leanne Caldwell, an anchor at Washington Post Live and co-author of the Early 202 newsletter. Usually when you see me, I am talking to members of Congress, but today we're doing something a little bit different. We're talking to two people who are making an incredible difference and in perhaps more than members of Congress on an issue that they care about, and that is elder care. So joining me today are actors Seth Rogen and Lauren Miller Rogan to talk about their experiences and their charity or their uh, their nonprofit Hilarity for Charity HFC that helps connect younger people who are taking care of aging family members. Seth Lauren, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, it's nice Hi. to see you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Of course, and to our audience, of course, we'd love you to get involved in this conversation. So feel free to tweet at us at Post Live if you have any questions. Um, so Lauren, Seth, this is a very personal issue actually for all three of us um, who have been involved in taking care of older family members. Lauren, I wanna start with you. Um, it was your mother who had Alzheimer's. Can you just tell me a little bit about her and about your experience? Yeah, I can. Um, you know, Alzheimer's is something that it's sort of unfortunately touched my life from a very young age. My grandfather had it from before I can remember. And then my grandmother had dementia. And, you know, I watched my grandmother care for my grandfather. And then I watched my mother care for my grandmother. Um, and she passed away when I was 18. Um, my mom was 48. Um, and then when I was at my college graduation, when I was only 22 and my mom was only 52, um, she repeated herself, uh, telling me a story a few times and my heart sank and I sort of instantly knew what the future was going to hold. Um, and then over the next 17 years, uh, we slowly, painfully lost my mom to Alzheimer's. She was officially diagnosed when she was, uh, close to 55 years old. So not that old. Um, yeah. and, uh, at all. And, um, and, you know, my father cared for her. Um, as her primary caregiver for many years. Um, eventually, uh, they lived in Florida, and eventually that was such a heavy load for him to, to carry that we moved them closer to us here in Los Angeles, and we were able to bring in full-time care, 24-7 uh, care for my mom to help my dad take care of her. Um, and once we started you know, getting a handle on that, we started talking about our experience and the idea to create an organization uh, sort of evolved and was born because we realized that our situation, while horrible, was helped tremendously by the fact that we could afford care, which is not a reality for so many people caring for yeah. their loved ones, yeah. whether it's with dementia or another disease, because our our country, unfortunately, doesn't support care at the level that we need it to. Um, and so through that experience of seeing the type of care that my mom needed and seeing the strain that it put on my dad um, and the fact that bringing in professional care was the only way that made it a little bit manageable. Uh, really, you know, the idea was born to be advocates for caregivers, to create program to support caregivers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I feel like I was talking. No, that was time. great. <laughs> yeah, no, and Seth, it was your mother-in-law, it's your in-laws who you were helping to care for. So can you talk about, about that dynamic as well? Because for me personally, it was also my father-in-law. Um, and so can you talk about the support, the role that you played? Was it a supportive role? How did it work with you guys? Here. Yeah, I uh, I tried to be as supportive as I could. I mean, we were pretty young when we started dealing with it. We were in our 20s, you know, um, and uh, it was my first real long term relationship I'd ever been in. And so, um, yeah, it was it was a lot. But at the same time, um, you know, it, I think it brought us closer ultimately. And I think it probably uh, forced us to confront um, many realities that we would have had to confront eventually, you know, um, and uh, if I can't, Seth's, yeah. Seth's mother, his sister, they're social workers. Yeah. His family oh, is wow. very oh. open about emotional health and how important it is to maintain that emotional health. Things like therapy are common words in the Rogan household. Oh, yeah. Right? Not a, yeah, so, very and, common. And, um, you know, so, so early on, although Seth hadn't had experience for 
you know, specifically with dementia, he was very caring toward me, you know, and I think, and he was the first one that was like, I love you. I'm here for you. You should go to therapy. And, yeah. It was know, clear. This was like a, a, a level of issue that a professional needed to address. Exactly. And that like, so many as much as I could love her and care for her, I didn't have like the tools to help one deal with that type of grief and trauma, like in real time, you know, it because was, it's extraordinary. Yeah. It was far beyond yeah. like what, yeah. uh, you know, what, what I was able to um, like actually genuinely help with, you know, I could support her, but I couldn't really help, you know? Yeah. And so can you always talk, maybe Lauren, this is better for you, but like, what was the hardest part? Of course, it's your mother, you're watching this decline, but also there's the day to day as well, the things you have to do, the things you have to get done in order just yeah. to get through the day. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, those early years I was living in Los Angeles, my parents were still in Florida, uh, where I had grown up. And, you know, I would come, you know, sometimes I'd come every month, sometimes it'd be a couple months. And I think in those early years, um, you know, I would talk to him and he would be like, it's not that bad, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's okay, we're, we're, I got a handle on things now. And then I would come and not having been there for four weeks, eight weeks, whatever it was, things would be a lot worse. And her level of care increased tremendously. Um, I, I would equate it to, you know, a, a newborn baby and how, you know, if you're with it every day, you don't notice it growing, but if you step away and then come back two months later, oh my God, it's huge. And so those losses of when she, you know, became non-communicative, uh, when bathroom issues became, uh, a part of the day to day, um, I think watching the toll that it took on my dad, who, you know, was an amazing beautiful caregiver, but wouldn't accept help in the beginning. He wanted to yeah. do it all on yeah. his own, which is very admirable, um, but not healthy. Um, you know, statistics show that often caregivers pass away before their loved one with the disease because caregiving is so difficult. Um, and I think that the years where I felt like we couldn't help uh, you know, until I realized that my dad could care for my mom and it was my role to care for him um, and getting him to accept that care. I think that was the hardest time. I don't know, years 15, 16, 17 in the end, you know, we're all pretty exhausted by that point. That was hard too. But, yeah. but I think yeah. those early years when we felt desperate without any idea of how do we make this situation better? Um, I think that was the hardest. Yeah. It was, that, yeah, that and, was not. No, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, and so that's why your, you know, HFC, Hilarity for Charity is so, is so phenomenal. And I want you to talk about that because I remember that stage and you also don't know where to look to find uh -huh. care. You don't know what resources are out there. You don't know what you can afford, if you can continue to afford it. There's, I mean, we'll talk about that in a second, but just, can you talk, Seth, a little bit about HFC and what it does and how it provides these resources um, for people who need care, need a break, need support? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think up until, you know, um, this moment in our lives when Lauren's mother uh, needed care and her father was attempting to care for her on uh, his own, um, it was actually maybe one of the first times in my, I didn't grow up with a lot of money by any means, you know, um, financial issues were like a constant issue uh, uh, for my family and a lot of decisions we made in our lives were like, Mine as well. yeah, we're yeah. like motivated by the fact that we didn't have a lot of money. But that being said, I think that this moment was the first moment, there's a plane if you can hear it, where um, like having a good amount of resources was like the definitive thing thing between our lives being livable and not livable and it was in that moment where you're like oh and this is so common and then you just start to realize like okay let's pretend we were just two people in our 20s who i didn't happen to have like an insanely high paying job and lauren has a is a writer and director and she gets paid well and uh, her brother luckily uh, gets paid well and between the three of us we have like a great amount of uh, financial resources, you know? Um, but if we did it, what would we do? Lauren's father would have to take care of uh, her mother. We'd have to move them out of Florida. We'd have to quit our jobs to help take care of them. We would then have no resources of our own and our life 
and and like five people's lives would essentially uh, be uh, ruined, you know. Um, and it just became so clear that if you are a young person dealing with parents who are just aging, there is like no infrastructure to support you. Slash, it might ruin your life. Um, and and that just isn't how it should be. Um, and I think America, especially, has abandon its aging uh, community. And I think culturally America treats its aging uh, population much differently slash worse than a lot of other countries do. And and the burden then falls on the younger people also. So even if, if that is their philosophy and they don't care about older people, it, the burden is falling on young people and ruining the lives of people in their 20s, 30s, 40s um, who have to abandon their careers um and their income uh, to take care of their parents you know um yeah. and it, it shouldn't be like that so we created a program where you can apply for grants and we will pay to have um in-home care come to your house and take care of uh your loved one um so you can have a job and go do things and and uh, and and this thing that is very natural and common does not ruin your entire life you know yeah, that, that's incredible. I mean, the amount of the, having that in support, in home support is just so important and so key. Yeah. Um, Lauren, can you talk about the role of the federal government? Um, should there be a role of the government in this sort of time in people's lives, not only for the person who needs care, but for the caregivers too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, first I should caveat by saying, you know, we're not policy experts. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with with caring across generations and, uh, you know, uh, work with them and they, I would call them the policy experts. We are caregiving experts, but I can tell you in the work that we've done, I have learned that yes, care is a societal responsibility, not a personal one. Um, in other developed nations, there are opportunities for individuals to get care that is subsidized or funded by government agencies. Um, we don't have that here. Um, and, you know, I think that by expanding care and not just for our aging population, I'm talking child care and just long term home care um, would help so many people, uh, not only caregivers, not only people who are afflicted with the disease, but caregiving as a, a job, as a career is an incredible field for people to go in and provides people meaning and the infrastructure currently in the care field needs a lot of work caregivers are often not paid enough um they're uh the infrastructure that that is sort of that creates the infrastructure of care jobs isn't structured in a way that caregivers get what they need to even provide the proper support. Um, and so we need a larger movement on the political side to come together. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, Build Back, Build Back Better had a large portion of funds going toward care infrastructure and that did not pass. And, you know, I think that it is something we are learning that care seems to be a partisan issue, which um, again, not a policy expert, won't dive into that too much, but it seems like uh, anyone who votes for care certainly wouldn't get my doesn't vote for care wouldn't get my vote uh, because it is a human right to age with dignity. And if you don't have proper care, you don't get that. And I think everyone needs to understand that and the way they vote for people and their representatives, if they don't understand that and they don't stand for that and they're not going to champion that in their work. Um, then that's the reason why we are where we are. Well, I first, <laughs> yeah, I first, I first, I first met with you guys or met you guys on Capitol Hill. You were in town. You were meeting with Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. He is someone who has been championing, um, you know, the federal government playing a much bigger role in the in elder caregiving. As you mentioned, um, you're not a policy expert, but you know it really well that it didn't make it and part of the Build Back Better package. Um, but I do want to ask you, Seth, as you've been on Capitol Hill talking to some members of Congress, um, what has been your biggest, 
I guess, surprise talking to them or not talking to them, getting meetings or not getting meetings with them? Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's so many things. <laughs> in a way, it was very eye-opening. Uh, you know, I think people have an abstract frustration with the government. And what's great is if you go to Washington, you get a much more specific frustration with the government. <laughs> um, I think you you get to really drill down on the nuance of why it doesn't function, why no one is doing their jobs properly. You get to see in real time people not being in the places that they, they said, they said they would be slash are expected to be slash paid to be by uh, the taxpayers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, getting a front row of that, like, I mean, Hollywood is a hundred million times more professional than Washington. I can say that without a doubt. We show up to our things, um, <laughs> you know, um, I was there, uh, you know, and so I think that's what's, uh, that what was shocking is that, uh, um, uh, there's an expectation also in Washington that it doesn't function properly and coming to Washington expecting it to function properly. I was viewed as an imbecile uh, that that that, oh, like you don't get it. No one does their job here. And your expectation that anyone would do their job uh, makes you stupid. Um, and that was uh, an eye opening experience as well, is that it's so uh, ingrained in everyone that the norm is that no one in Washington does what they're expected, that you are uh, you are you are naive in this world to expect them to. Uh, that being said, so it, was, some it was a great experience. It was a great experience. Your trip to DC. You're going to be coming back, right? Yeah. Exactly. I've turned down a few uh, invitations to, to that any. correspondence dinner over the years. <laughs> I think, uh, but then you meet with uh, you know someone like uh, Senator Casey, who who genuinely cares, and you see their frustration, and you see that they care, and you see that they're. Um, having to work with people who are not just trying to help and provide care for people, but are literally trying to like dismantle the government as we know it. And 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 I could imagine how frustrating it would be for these people to have to work across the desk from uh, people who um, ideologically don't even think people should be provided this care or respite in any way by the federal government slash maybe there should be federal uh, no federal government you know so um i'd say it's been eye-opening the fact that care is a partisan issue and that aging with dignity is a partisan issue is it's sad and it's uh i think it speaks to how everything um can become partisan if you simply choose to disagree with every single thing that your opponent says um, and which kind of is what seems to have happened you know um they could uh, you know yeah it feels like they could have like a free birthday cake day but if uh you know if so one, one side one proposed, side proposed it, it the other one would say no yeah <laughs> so i i mean are you are you guys have this very successful charity you've raised 18 million dollars you're providing grants to people you're providing providing support to people are you going to focus your efforts on that? Is that the way to go? Or have you given up on Washington, D.C. being able to do something about this? No, I, w I would never give up no. um, because that would be silly. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, I think we, you know, we as a organization, I think our focus is to for care. Right. And on one side, we help people care for their brains. Um, and we teach people how to keep their brains healthy because science tells us that maybe we can delay or even prevent dementia with living a brain healthy lifestyle. Um, and so we really try to educate people um, on how to do that. Um, and then on the other side is we care for caregivers. And so we'll never stop doing either of those. And I think that care for caregivers makes so much sense. And I fully believe perhaps in my naive heart that the more we share that message and spread it around, people will agree that people need better care, caregivers need better support. It's happened. It seems obvious. Seems I don't obvious. know. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can get in the right rooms with people and change their minds. Last time we had a lovely day where we met with people who agreed with us. Yeah. And I think that it would be interesting to be in some rooms with people who don't agree that care is a fundamental right and to have those conversations and understand why they voted against it. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, to answer your question, no, we won't, we won't stop because yeah. 
because the truth is the need isn't is extreme now it's going to get even worse you know our, our our baby boomer population is reaching the age where care is going to be critical and we don't have the caregivers to meet that need people will have to give up their lives to care for their loved ones and i i think that the more this happens in the next five ten years literally right upon us um hopefully you know the shift will come because more and more people will understand the need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're talking a lot about caregivers, but I also want to talk about the healthcare workers too. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a shortage. Workers are sometimes hard to come by or hard to keep. It's for people unlike you who don't have resources. Um, it's hard to pay for them. Um, so can you talk about even you guys with, you know, with resources, with funds, was it hard for you to also find workers, keep workers and the right workers and ones that clicked with your family? What was that like? Yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, I think convincing most people from the generation that Lauren's father is a part of to even accept help in any way, shape or form is a challenge, you know, um, I think it's been a, a generation was burdened with the message that you don't accept help from uh, anybody <laughs> and you do it all yeah. yourself and you can't do it. You don't deserve it, which is like not the way life works. And it's not a message that should be instilled in anybody. Um, but it, it is unfortunately like a mountain. I think a lot of people from our generation are often climbing with their parents is like, you can't do this on your own. You need help. It's not a failure on your part. You were lied to. Like, uh, you should have never been told you could handle this all on your own. That is not true. Um, and that, um, you know, was is a real challenge, I think. And, 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 but once, once that part uh, happened, yeah, I, I think we, we worked with, you know, there, there are various, uh, organizations we we work with home instead and 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 there are uh, you know um infrastructures of once you have the resources to find people that match up to your needs and personality uh types and all that and and lauren's mother was cared for by uh some wonderful 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 women who Angels. um yeah were uh truly like an inter you know an integral part of our uh lives you know but yeah a big part of the problem is that these people are not paid very well and a lot of the companies that you pay are paid very well but the people um in the companies are not paid as well and therefore it's not a career that is drawing people and um uh yeah the level of training that is provided to someone who wants to get into the caregiving field a professional caregiving field is there's no standard for that uh there's often very little attention paid to that there's very little attention often paid to their safety and well-being whether it be insurance or uh you know just standards of uh to to protect professional caregivers um there is so little infrastructure there and again organizations like care across generations are really in the front lines of that um and you know but but the fact that this field could be so prosperous um but because there is so little infrastructure in it young people aren't even sure how or why they would go into it or how to go into it um and so you know i think that there is a lot of work to be done in um you know really investing in that care workforce um to really protect care workers um and to encourage them and lift them up yeah. because again the work that these people are doing is incredible it's so important the women who cared for my mom were unbelievable angels and yes over the 10 years that we had professional care yeah. i guess yes we had you know a few people here and there one woman the whole time Oh my God, she's amazing. Um, and you know, and but but what they go through, they should they should get more. And the government should subsidize it. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and it is not you know the government. We pay taxes, and in many other walks of life, they pay they protect us. You know, mm -hmm. they provide us with things that protect us in exchange for our taxes, and that's why we live in a society. But uh, you know, I think again, people have decided that if you are aging, you are undeserving of protection from the government basically yeah. uh, and and that's a big problem yeah Lauren in a previous interview format that you've done before you said something that was so poignant to me you said um I'm paraphrasing here but at some point everyone needs care we're all going to need care at some point and so can mm -hmm. you just talk about 
how there needs to be, does there still need to be a shift in then that mentality that it might not be our problem now, but it's probably going to be our problem later? Yeah, I mean, we're all one diagnosis away from needing care of some kind, right? And I think that young people, um, of course, are invincible and nothing's ever going to bog them down. They're not going to hit any roadblocks or speed bumps toward their life of success and happiness. And then something does because we're humans and that's a reality. Um, and I probably was paraphrasing Rosalind Carter, who said there's something and I'll botch this, but something along the lines of there are three types of people in the world, those who provide care, those who need care, and those who will need care. That's not it, but it's something like that. <laughs> <It sounds good. laughs> and, and that's the truth. And I think that humans are afraid of death and we've created all these constructs to help us rationalize it, face it, accept it, et cetera. Um, and therefore the, whatever decline you take toward that death, whether it be disease or not, um, that's scary. And I understand that. And I spent a lot of years being scared too um, and in denial, um, but eventually you have to be in reality, which is that we are humans, we all need care and we are all in this together. Um, and we need to be there for each other, whether it's by, you know, lifting up paid caregivers, providing caregivers for family caregivers, um, or support in any way, because as we said, like this is a societal issue, not a personal issue. It affects everyone. You will not escape your life without having to care for someone else or needing care up for yourself, period, mm -hmm. end of story. Can each of you give the audience, us all, some sort of advice, something that you wish you knew before that that you might need in the future, that we might need in the future about caregiving? Um, uh, I think having hard, honest conversations with the people in your life who are finding themselves in this situation was um a very important of the process and not a pleasant part of the process but i've seen people also in our lives like go through years of pain that maybe like one incredibly uncomfortable conversation could have alleviated you know um and that's a thing people do there are studies you know they people say like people people would rather get murdered than have an uncomfortable conversation sometimes you know like it's a thing people don't like like people really don't like confronting people they don't like saying things that they know someone isn't going to want to hear um it, it, it's um it's something that we go through a great lengths that are counterintuitive to not do and it's something my dad actually is probably the one because he's so weird i think maybe he's like missing the part of his brain that finds these conversations uncomfortable but he was he was kind of the one who started to rip the band-aid off with lauren's father and their family in some ways and started just saying the things that we had all been thinking and he just was like i'm gonna say them you know and and wow. it and once you say a thing you can't unsay it and if it's a thing that's real then then it's then it's out there and you have to address it you know and that um yeah is something that i recommend people uh, think of the things they're avoiding saying and maybe uh, think of saying them, you know? I would say the thing that I didn't know then that I do know now, um, this is going to shock Seth if you go back to who I was 10, 15 years ago, is that there is hope. <laughs> I really thought we were in a hopeless situation. I, I like truly had multiple conversations with multiple people, multiple, you know, my therapist, uh, you know, this is the worst thing. I can't think of any way out of it. No, there is no light in this situation. And now I can say that that's not true. And I have found personally so much in it. I found community. I found hope. I found sharing. I found connection. But beyond me, beyond our organization, I do think the conversation is changing. The fact that CARE was in a giant infrastructure bill and got as far as it did is hopeful. The fact that we are having this conversation now is hopeful. The fact that HFC has tons of resources for caregivers, which we didn't have 10 years ago because we didn't know about them, is hopeful. And I think that to me, that is what I've learned, that having someone, having a loved one with, with dementia, 
uh, being a caregiver is not a hopeless situation. There is support, there is care out there, um, and and there is a way through it. Mm. How about that? Pretty good. Yeah. Used to be real yeah. <laughs> yes, now she's not <laughs> negative at all. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was beautiful though, but it's also true, especially when you're kind of out of it and you look back and you see like all these gifts that you actually got from it that you didn't know you were getting while you were going through it. Um, you guys, thank you so much for your time today. We are out of time, but I thoroughly enjoyed it, hearing your perspective and just your such an important experience to share with everyone and all the work you're doing. Uh, Lauren Miller Rogan, Seth Rogan, thanks so much. Thank you for having, for having us. Good to see you. And thank you all for watching. And to see this program and other programs, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Thanks so much.